Welcome everyone to another edition of Teach the Geek Interviews. My name is Neil Thompson. I am the founder of Teach the Geek. It's an online platform for science and engineering professionals. The first offering of the platform is a public speaking course called Teach the Geek to Speak. To learn more about it, you can go to teachthegeek.com. Again, that's teachthegeek.com. Today, my guest is Dr. Sarah Burchill. She is a freelance science writer and presenter. As a writer, she, she writes for children's magazines and as a presenter, she speaks mostly to teachers and other science communication professionals while also running children's workshops. I'm curious to find out about her motivation to get into science communication and presenting, her previous working life, and any tips she has on public speaking. Welcome to Teach the Geek Interviews, Sarah. Hi, Neil. It's lovely to be here. Wonderful. So from the bit of research I did on you, I saw that you got degrees in, in botany. What was the motivation to go down that route? So I grew up in the countryside in Northamptonshire in England. So it's kind of in the middle, uh, fairly featureless. There's no mountains, there's no nothing, but there are a lot of plants. Um, and I spent a lot of my childhood sort of making mud pies and uh, playing around in ditches and streams and all sorts of things, and very much immersed in the natural world. Um, and it's just something that I followed through on. Oh, one question I probably should have asked, what what does botany mean? <laughs> so botany, uh, children always tell me it's the study of bottoms, um, but it's definitely not that. <laughs> it is the study of plants. Okay, and I also, you know, I didn't call you Dr. Birchall, so you actually got your PhD in it. What was the motivation uh -huh. to go all the way and get a PhD? Ah, so uh, it wasn't just so I would never be missed. Um, it was mostly <laughs> because. Um, so I did my degree, then I did a master's and I trained in practical horticulture. So I was running a, uh, like a small botanic supply unit where we grew plants for university supply for like uh, research and for tutorials and things. Um, and I really, really wanted to teach because that was the bit I was really enjoying that I was doing. I was helping on field courses and things. I absolutely loved it, but I realised I wasn't going to get any further without PhD. So I went back as a mature student, got my PhD, and at the end of it, realised that I was never going to have the stellar research career that you need to get into teaching in a university in the UK. Um, so I went off and did other things instead. What was it like going back to school at, at, you know, as a mature student? Was it any different than when you did your, your undergraduate degree? So I think mature in name only, not necessarily in mindset. Um, so I was only in my late twenties. I wasn't particularly mature. Um, but when I went back and did my PhD, having had a job, it meant that I did my PhD studies from, I would be in the lab by eight o'clock in the morning and I'd leave at four o'clock in the afternoon. And I could do that every day of the week because I was used to you know, work hours. So it was nice and easy for me, and it meant that I got it done in three years, which is all the funding you get in the UK to do a PhD. Um, so it actually served me really well, having been in the world of work. Okay. What kind of, what kind of work did you do before you started the PhD program? So that was running the botanic supply unit. So growing different plants, uh, like pea shoots and tomatoes, and the lovely Arabidopsis for genetics research. And then we also had a big botanical glass house with like a big tree fern and a banana plant and that sort of thing that we used for teaching the undergraduate. And as part of that job, I used to teach on field courses in the Canary Islands, which is beautiful just off the coast of North Africa, um, teaching plant geography there. And also in the rather wet uh, Snowdonia part of North Wales in the UK, which was much colder and much wetter, but no less beautiful. <laughs> nice. So then you finished your PhD. Did you have any plans on, on what you were going to do next? So my original plan was to do a postdoc, you know, go and do a bit of a bit of research whilst looking around for a suitable teaching post. Um, but I couldn't find anything. So I ended up sort of going into, I did, I did various sort of short term contracts. I did some freelance university lecturing, which was quite interesting because I got to nose inside other departments. Um, and then um, 
I got a job working at the University of Oxford in one of the colleges helping with admissions, which was really, really interesting to see it from the inside and to see how that kind of thing works. Um, and then I had children, which were, oh, it shouldn't really be a surprise to a biologist, but, <laughs> but they weren't, <laughs> weren't entirely anticipated at that point. Uh, so having had children, I then needed to find work that I could do around the kids, um, which proved to be rather more difficult than I thought it would be, because I'm quite a control freak, so I like to be in control of my children. Um, so um, I looked around for lots of different jobs, and I started volunteering at our local primary school, uh, helping them with science, and they said, you're better than people that we pay for. And I thought, well, hang on, there could be a job in this. So I decided to give myself a year in which I would take every opportunity that was offered to me. I would say yes to everything within reason. Um, and if I, by the end of that year, if I built up enough sort of contacts, a big enough network um, and got everything working nicely, then I'd launch that into a career. That was the plan. Okay. You know, I wrote a, a LinkedIn post yesterday or yesterday or two days ago about people getting degrees and not necessarily working in the degree that they, they got the, the working in the field in which they got their degree in. And I, th I think the what a lot of people, especially the ones that get PhDs do, I think that a lot of them are kind of like you in the sense that you get a PhD and you think you're going to do a postdoc and then get a teaching position. But there, unfortunately, there aren't as many teaching positions as there are people that get PhDs. So the, those people are kind of have, have a choice to make whether you, you know, continue going down that path of, of waiting and, and hoping that you get this teaching position or you, you'll try to find something else to do. So the fact that you ended up working in admissions at a, at a university, that's probably as far away from a PhD from, uh, in botany as you can get. I mean, what does is, what is admissions have to do with botany? But you at least you saw you, saw, you were open to possibilities. And then you even volunteered at, at a school and now that kind of led to, I'm assuming that led to the work that you're doing now. If you were more closed off in your thinking, thinking that I have to get something in botany, I got a degree in botany, a PhD at, 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 in botany, I got to do, I got to do botany. But you kept yourself open to, to doing other things and now look, you're, you're doing something that I'm sure you're, you're very happy with. Yeah, I mean, it's like any scientific degree, you cover such a breadth of skills. And you might come out thinking that you're an engineer or a physicist, but actually you've got a lot of really useful transferable skills that can go on and be used. You are an organized person, you are a dedicated person, someone who's able to find out information through the research that you've had to do for papers during your degree. So actually you're suited to a huge range of jobs. Yeah. So then you volunteered with the if this, with the school and, and they told you that the, you are actually better than the people that they pay to do it. And so you saw that there was a potential job in it. So when you say you volunteered with them, what, what kind of, or I guess the work that you do with the school, what does that look like? Uh, so this was just going in and helping. We did a project growing sunflowers with the smallest children in the school. So we're talking four and five year olds. Um, and they all sowed their sunflower seeds and we transplanted them and we put them in pots with a stake and then they took them home and then they took photographs of them and we had a big sort of measuring competition at the end of the year. Um, and then I created this sunflower that we raised up on a piece of string so that it went up and up as we announced the height of each of the children's sunflowers so they could really understand the height of the plant. Um, and they absolutely loved that. We also did a project involving growing a loaf of bread so that was um, the children sow the seed, sow the wheat seed in the school grounds and they tend it. And then the following summer, they harvest it, we dry it, then we thresh and winnow it by hand. Uh, and then maybe if we can take it to the windmill in the next village and get it ground into flour, which they then bake into bread and give over to the village church for harvest festival. Wow. So things like that, so there's botany in there. <laughs> yeah, it's, 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 it sounds like a, a lot of a lot of things in there for sure. Huh. When, when it comes to the, the the work that you do with children, I correct me if I'm wrong, but I assume you work with children of different ages. How do you approach science based on the children's age? Um, I don't know. 
but it's a it's kind of a case of getting to know children of different ages and then you learn how to pitch things to make things exciting for them and um things that will really appeal to them so for example uh, the sort of my, um, my biggest workshop that i do is called the cloud factory and it's basically the same experiment of making a cloud using dry ice and hot water. You get the sublimation of the dry ice and you get condensation of a cloud appearing. So we do that same experiment in different ways. And with small children, we'll talk about their senses and their experience of it. And then with older children, we can talk about sublimation, states of matter, we can go into the chemistry of it, we can talk about you know, how things expand and contract, and you can get in more science with the older children so the same activity works for everyone and then you also do work with teachers and science communicators in general how do you approach to, uh, talking to to them about science much the same as i do with children to be honest um it's you know you have universal appeals if you give somebody a cloud to handle whether they are a fully grown adult or a child their wonder when they've got a cloud that smells of black currants in their hand and they put it to their mouth they are utterly amazed no matter how old they are and you can hang as much science on that as you want to uh, depending upon you know what your audience is like and what they want to know um, so when i'm working with teachers i'm mainly sharing resources that i've developed for schools um, so I've had quite a bit of funding from people like the Royal Society of Chemistry here in the UK to develop resources for teachers. So I'll go to conferences and share those and say, look, look, I made this. It's free. It's for you. Take it and play with it. Um, and then if I'm talking to other science communicators, I'm basically sharing similar resources and similar things that I've done. Um, it's all about sharing what you have learned and helping others to improve their practice as well. Um, so there's a great network in the UK called the Big STEM Communicators Network. Um, and they're really good at getting people together and just discussing, look, I've made this, you might find it useful. Um, and that's really good because you get to meet people from all over the place. Doing that. Do you work with certain schools or, or is it just one school that you work with? Okay, so I'm a freelancer, so I go into loads of different schools in different areas. Um, but a lot of my work is also with science festivals. In the UK, we've got a really great culture has developed of science festivals in like the different towns around the country, um, often organized by their university. Um, and they'll bring in sort of outsiders like me to bring in something amazing that they know will work for them. So there's like a, a a little group of people who go around doing lots of different science festivals um, but it's really nice because you actually get to feel not quite so much like a freelancer and like you actually work with people when it comes to communicating science how do you communicate to people or how do you communicate partic particular scientific topics that might be controversial um I don't really cover anything particularly controversial. So the workshops that I deliver to children will be literally delivering the national curriculum uh, type topics. So we'll be looking at maybe launching paper airplanes or rockets and talking about forces, or we'll be uh, talking about states of matter or exploring that sort of stuff. So I don't actually really cover anything particularly controversial with children. Um, apart from when I do something called Ask a Scientist uh, in one of my schools and I invite children to ask any question they want about the scientific world or about how things work and I will try and come up with an experiment to explain it um, or to um, help them explore the ideas behind it. So it's very much about us learning together to find out what's going on. So we did one about um, bees. A child had come up to me with a dead bee in her hand. Lovely, lovely, fluffy bee she got on her hand that was dead and she was very upset about this. And there'd been lots in the news about the death, uh, high levels of bee deaths in the UK. Um, so we talked about bees and what they do for us and how we can look after them. And I take it from that perspective as to how we can work together to help solve the problem. Okay. When it comes to 
to work. I, I get the sense that a lot of people, when they go, you know, they go to school, they get a degree, and then they get a job. But you, you work as, as a freelancer. What challenges have you come across being a freelancer, and how have you addressed them? Oh, well, this year has been terrible. <laughs> there is no denying it. Uh, because a lot of my work has been, is in schools and at science festivals, all of that work has been cancelled. Um, schools are very nervous about having outsiders like me in at the moment. So at the moment I'm mostly writing, so I write for a couple of children's, three children's magazines in the UK and I work for a charity called the Lightyear Foundation who aim to make science accessible to children with disabilities and with additional needs. So I'm doing a live uh, online science club for them tomorrow, which is great fun. That's really lovely. Um, but the thing with being a freelancer is you need to have lots of strings to your bow. So I've got the regular science writing jobs. I normally have regular science festival jobs and some regular schools work as well. But then I've got the work with the charity. So that happens, that's sort of ticking over as well. So it's a case of having your finger in lots of different pies so that when something shuts down as it has this year, you know, you're not left totally stranded. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, that, that's kind of been the case for, well, everybody. I kind of have to make shifts and kind of figure out what, what, what to do because of this whole pandemic. I'm, I'm kind of surprised that the, the schools haven't moved to more virtual type of presentations. So they just canceled everything? So in the, in the UK, we had a lockdown from, it was, schools were closed from March right through to the summer holidays for most years. I mean, some of the younger children did go back, um, but that was all online learning. And the teachers were struggling so much to try and produce meaningful online content that met the needs of the curriculum and of exam courses for older children, that they didn't have the capacity to go out and find people like me to do other stuff um, so they were very much under pressure as it was and I think anything anything more than that rather than just trying to deliver their curriculum was um, very difficult at the time. Now in the UK now as of Thursday we're going into another whole country lockdown um, and that's for four weeks only it's taking us up to the start of December um, but they're keeping the schools open this time. So we'll see what changes. Okay. When it comes to just you know, because of your job, you you present in front of adults and and children alike. Has public speaking been something you've always been good at? And if not, what did you do to get better at it? Um. Hmm. So in my year where I said that I would say yes to everything, um, I worked in schools and I also signed up, some may say ill-advisedly, for um, some stand-up science, sort of a stand-up comedy night. Uh, so that found me, I was in a pub on a Friday night making fake poo for people who'd been drinking, um, <laughs> which you can, it was actually, an activity that I do with children that I just translated directly to adults and they reacted in exactly the same way as six-year-olds it was beautiful huh. Big poo. Yeah. So <laughs> that, that kind of gave me confidence nice when it comes to any presentations that you do do you have a process for putting those presentations together and if so what is it yeah so I start off when I'm thinking about something new I write what I call the script ish uh, it's not a proper script I've got one here somewhere hang on so this is one for the science club tomorrow um, and it will say the things that I would like to say in an ideal world you know if I was going to remember absolutely everything the correct tone of voice and the right way of questioning the audience to get the answers, because that's how you work with children, by questioning them, so that they come up with the answers. Um, so I would, I write that to start off with, and then I'll run through it and do a practice, you know, just at my dining table, and make sure everything runs properly, that it, that it sounds right. Um, and sometimes I'll even video myself doing one of those, so I can see where things 
are going right and where they're not working. Because you know you can tell when something isn't going to play with an audience. Um, so I'll run through that and then make notes on that and correct it. And then I put it totally to one side and ignore it for the session. I won't look at it. I don't try and you know work from it. Um, but what I'm trying to do is to remember what I wrote out and keep it in that order. Um, and I actually find it works really well because it means that your language is more spontaneous than if you learn a very clear script. Um, and it also means that when I'm working with somebody else, so one of my big events each year is at this massive exhibition centre in Birmingham um, in the UK. And I have somebody who I employ to come and work with me. And he also reads the scriptish, but then he translates it into his language. So it feels natural coming out of him you know it's it's his choice of words so the script ish idea seems to work quite nicely for for people to add their own personality all right <laughs> script ish first time i ever heard that word <laughs> <laughs> learn something new it's every like day script but not <laughs> <laughs> got it when it comes to public speaking in general do you ever get nervous before giving your presentations and if so how do you deal with your nerves oh so I think the first time I stood up at a teacher conference, because I'm not a teacher, I have never been trained to be a teacher. And they've asked me to come and stand at the front in front of 300 teachers and tell them how to teach. Um, so it gives you terrible imposter syndrome, like you don't deserve to be there. Um, but once you start talking and sharing resources, so my way of uh, talking at a teacher conference is I will take along examples of the things that I use when I'm teaching. I will take along an experiment and get one of the teachers up to come and do the experiment in the same way that I would if I had an audience of children. So it's getting the audience involved like that. And you find that people are very forgiving and very welcoming when they realise that you're there, you know, to help and to give things to them. They're incredibly forgiving and it gets rid of all of your imposter syndrome straight away. Wonderful. Yeah, yeah, I'm sure. I'm sure that's help. Um, that's certainly helpful. Yeah, you're right. I mean, you're there for a reason, and and they're there to learn. You're there to impart knowledge that perhaps they didn't have already. So you yeah, know, I a, do. Oh, please go ahead. Yeah, I do find having props is really useful as well. So like I'm waving around my scriptish at you. If I were talking to a group of teachers, I would have a copy of the magazine that I'm talking about to hold up. Rather than using slides, because then people are looking at the slides, not at you. Um, so I would tend to have like a picture of, you know, this came in the post today. Whiz pop bang, one of the magazines that I write for, for elementary age children. Um, and I've written a game in there and some more questions for children. So I would hold up the magazine and talk about it. Or I would get out my uh, rocket launcher and we would demonstrate the rocket launcher in front of people. But by having those props available, it reminds me what's coming next without the need for slides. So that helps to sort of keep you calm and you know what's coming next. And you can keep to your script ish. Um, and also by having actual items that people can come up and look at afterwards, it helps you to break down that boundary with the audience. So they make it makes them feel like you're more approachable and you're open to questions and they'll come up and have a look and have a think and ask questions afterwards. They're too shy to ask in front of everybody. That's, that's, that's smart. smart. That's, that's, a, that's an excellent idea. So, you know, you have your, your various tips that you've already offered. Having props is helpful and kind of trying to stay away from slides because people will look at the slides as opposed to looking at the actual or listening to the presenter. You know, present or even in preparing your presentation, having a script-ish to kind of keep you on track on the things that you want to say. Are there any other important tips that you'd like to, to add about how you can become more effective at public speaking? Okay, so I work a lot with children with additional needs. Um, so I, I, have thing, I have some bugbears about uh, presenters who pace around and you can't see their faces. So a lot of people need to see your face when you're talking so they can see your lips if they lip read or so they can get clues from your face about how you feel about something. So facing your audience is really key. But also in facing your audience, not only can they lip read and pick up on cues from you, but you can pick up on cues from them. So it's really important to monitor, are your audience falling asleep? Uh, has, has anybody got their phone out, that awful sin of having somebody in the audience having their phone out? 
a real hatred of mine. Um, so it's, if you're monitoring for that sort of stuff, if you're looking up and looking at your audience rather than looking up at the slides, then you can, you know, you can alter what you're saying and tailor it for them. If you've lost your audience, go back and sort of reiterate the point at which you think you lost them and try and explain it in, you know, in a slightly different way. That's way more important with technical presentations than with anything else. Yeah, yeah, I think you're, you're absolutely right when it comes to trying to keep, maintain people's attention and engaging an audience, just looking at them is really important. And you're right, if you look at the screen or look at your slides and you're not looking at the audience, then you give them that opportunity to get on their phone. You give them that opportunity to fall asleep. You're not going to, some of them are probably not going to try to fall asleep if you're looking right at them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this is, that, that was, that's an excellent tip. Is there anything else that you'd like to add, Sarah, on anything that you're working on? Um, I don't think there is at the moment. There's all sorts of ideas always going around in my head, you know, plans for books and articles and all sorts of different new shows uh, when we can get back in big venues and get children together handling things and, you know, getting their hands on and doing experiments. Uh, just really looking forward to the time when we can do that again, really. Yeah, for sure. Well, everyone, that marks the end of another edition of Teach the Geek interviews. My name is Neil Thompson. I'm the founder of Teach the Geek. It's an online platform for science and engineering professionals. The first offering of the platform is a public speaking course, and it's called Teach the Geek to Speak. To learn more about it, you can go to teachthegeek.com. Again, that's teachthegeek.com. Until next time, take care and stay safe. Thanks, Sarah. Thank you.